Ari, that was uh, such great enthusiasm in which you always bring to these programs. So it's just wonderful to begin to be a part again with everybody. And uh, let's uh, commence. England as the custodian of the Jewish past. We've been um, last two Sundays visiting the two great university centers of Oxford and Cambridge. But there are many, many more places in England that have incredible treasures of the Jewish past, including the two which we will visit today, the British Library and the British Museum, which were essentially one and the same, as I will explain, historically one and the same, and uh, the John Rylands Library uh, in Manchester. So let's uh, commence. We're gonna start in London with the British Museum. Um, the British Museum was built in 1753. It's one of the oldest uh, public museums in the world, not the oldest actually even in the, in the UK, which honor goes to the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford, but certainly by 17, middle of the 1700s, uh, England is um, ahead of the curve compared to some of the other Europeans' uh, powers in creating a national museum, the British Museum, 1753. Uh, about a century later, they added the British Museum Reading Room. And this is where the British Library um, actually is held. This is where the British Library uh, exists. Sorry to, uh, sorry to interrupt, Professor Ensberg, but you have an issue on your screen. You have some blocks of like yeah. blackness yeah. above. And I just got the message from my wife, Melissa, as well. Let me stop sharing. And let me share again. Let me... While you're doing that, I, I will just uh, welcome Rachel Kolsky. Remember Rachel, our tour guide from England? So Rachel is in the room. And so you can text her a private message. I'll set it up. You can say hi to Rachel and um, we're back in business here. Is that better? Yes. Yes. Okay, but I wanna try one more thing because one of the issues was I... Okay, well, while you're doing that, I should put another promo piece. I forgot to mention that Mark Michael Epstein you know, the creator of this t-shirt, that, that looks bad. That's back bad. Okay, so I know what the problem is, okay. Mark Michael Epstein is back with us tomorrow, 11 a.m. Uh, Secrets of the Bible, we're going book by book as we change books, as you may know, if you went to synagogue this past Shabbat, we finished Breshi, Genesis, headed to Exodus, join us for Mark Michael Epstein tomorrow at 11 a.m. Pacific. Okay, how's that? One of the issues was, this is part of the technology of, um, Zoom, for those of you who know some of the features, um, I'm giving away the end of the program, but I wanted to share a, a video clip with you. So I optimized it for video uh, uh, sharing and must have messed up the rest of the program. So maybe at the very end, I'll have to exit and go back. We'll see how that works. In any case, okay, so where were we? The British uh, Museum um, built in 1753. And then about a century later, uh, the British Museum reading room is added onto it. There, this will become the British Library in a new location, but for now, just realize that the British Library is, doesn't exist yet officially. It's actually all part of the British Museum. Uh, and there's a close-up of what the reading room uh, looks like or used to look like. Okay, uh, museums constantly add to their collections and need more space. Libraries constantly add to their collections and need more space. And so eventually, as we move into the 1960s and 1970s, it was clear that the two institutions would have to uh, separate, and they did. Uh, by an act of parliament in 1973, the British Library was created as a separate institution, and it took 25 years for all the planning and everything, and eventually it gets built and opens up in 1998. My first visits to England in the 1970s and 1980s, I was still going to the British Museum to look at the books and manuscripts. Uh, today, they're all housed here at this uh, very modern building, uh, almost brutalist architecture. And that is the great Sir Isaac Newton doing his mathematics and geometry that you see there in a statue based on, by the way, a piece of art um, by uh, William Blake. Uh, and another beautiful view of the entire uh, library um, uh, compound, if I can use that word, here's the main building, here's the Isaac Newton statue. And this is the beautiful St. Pancras railway station. For those of you who know London, this is where the Eurostar leaves for um, Paris, Brussels, etc. Although apparently not this week, because once again, 
London is closing down as are other parts of Europe due to the spread of the Omicron uh, variant. So that's the British Library today. So much of what I'm gonna be talking about is the British Museum because that's when the manuscripts that we're gonna show entered the collection, but now of course they're all at the British Library. And here are the two institutions on a map of London and you can see St. Pancras International Railway Station right next to the British Library and the British Museum in the heart of Bloomsbury uh, next to the UCL campus, part of the Greater University of London umbrella. Okay, so that's just an introduction. We begin our story with the most remarkable component of everything I'm going to speak about today and perhaps everything I've spoken about during these three weeks. Uh, let me introduce you to the Duke of Sussex. When I say the Duke of Sussex, you probably think Prince Harry. That is the recreation of the Duke, uh, Dukedom of Sussex uh, in the 21st century. Uh, an earlier version of this royal title uh, went to Prince Augustus Frederick, and there are the years of his life, died in 1843. He is the son of King George III. Now, Americans grow up and George III is always the enemy. Of course, for the British, he is quite a prominent king who ruled for a very long time. And this is one of his sons, uh, the Duke of Sussex. He was a collector of Hebrew manuscripts, but that's only the beginning of the story, one of which you see here, uh, the crown jewel of his personal collection known as the Duke of Sussex Bible, uh, now in the British Library. So here he is as an older gentleman, and here is his biography. The son of George III, the brother of George IV, and the favorite uncle of Queen Victoria. In fact, when Queen Victoria married Prince Albert, it was this gentleman who walked her down the aisle because her father had already deceased. It's this um, Prince Augustus Frederick, the Duke of Sussex, who walks Queen Victoria down the aisle. He held the title of governor of Windsor Castle. And he fought assiduously for the civil rights of the Jews in the United Kingdom. They still did not have full civil rights. And he himself personally learned Hebrew, as you'll see in a moment. He became the royal patron of the Jews Hospital and Orphan Asylum which eventually over the course of almost 200 years morphs into the Norwood charity. Those of us who are listening, those of you who are listening from the UK will certainly know the Norwood charity as it is known today. All of this goes back to the early 1800s in the personage of this incredible individual right here. And his working for the civil rights of the Jews, by the way, eventually led to Lord Montefiore being elected to be the sheriff of the city of London, really the first Jew to hold any kind of a political office while the prince was still alive. And after his death, but he certainly paved the way for the first Jewish member of parliament, and that would be Lord Rothschild. So there's quite a bit of remarkable um, uh, features to this incredible individual's life. He amassed a library of about 50,000 volumes in his personal library. Now, all of those are not manuscripts. The vast majority of those are printed books because by the time that he is collecting in the early 1800s, we have three plus centuries of printing. But he also collected manuscripts, including Hebrew ones, as I showed you just a moment ago. Uh, he hired Thomas Joseph Pettigrew to create a catalog of his library. I mean, somebody has to give some organization to all of this. And this is the catalog uh, created by uh, Dr. Pettigrew, who was a physician first and foremost, by the way, but also a bibliophile. And you can see here from the title page that he was in fact the personal physician uh, to the Duke of Sussex and also to the Princess Victoria. You can see how all of these people in the royal family were closely connected to one another. Um, the Duke of Sussex, um, the prince lived in Kensington Palace, which you probably know, which I'll show you in a moment. And his uh, royal coat of arms is in fact, as you see there on the left, the lion and the unicorn, which Ari is now displaying on the shirt that he showed in the introduction. So this is a great coincidence. Ari didn't know about this and I didn't know about his shirt that he was wearing today, uh, which he described earlier, but it all, all the lines converge to show you how uh, obviously the um, Orange County program is always correctly with it, no matter who's speaking, 
uh, uh, amongst all the numbers of great speakers who come to the programming. Okay, so there's Dr. Pettigrew's um, catalog, uh, three volumes produced in 1827. Here's Kensington Palace in London, uh, where the Duke of Sussex lived. Many of you will know it from more recent history as the former home to Charles and Diana, the Prince and Princess of Wales, and the current home of um, His Royal Highness uh, William and uh, Catherine, the Duke and Duchess of uh, Cambridge. So this is a building with ste steeped in British royal history, uh, right uh, in Kensington Gardens, uh, adjacent to Hyde Park in the center of London, for those of you who know the city. And uh, imagine in this building 200 years ago, the Duke of Sussex's personal library of 50,000 volumes, including Hebrew manuscripts. So when you watch programs like The Crown or Downton Abbey, and they go into these stately homes, and I'm being very serious now, and you see these libraries there, think about what was in these libraries or what is still in these libraries. Now, in almost all cases, manuscripts have moved from these uh, personal, from these private collections into the great museums and libraries of England and elsewhere in the world. The books very often are still there, although there are occasional, occasionally still some Hebrew manuscripts in private collections, including, for example, at Longleat House in Wiltshire, which um, is owned by the Marquis of Bath, which my wife Melissa and I visited about uh, four years ago. So uh, this is all part of the heritage of England. Now, His Royal Highness Augustus Frederick learned Hebrew so well that he could actually write, and I'm just going to give you one line here. Uh, later uh, in his life, uh, his correspondence was actually collected and printed in a book. He corresponded with Rabbi Abraham Belias, who had moved from Tunis, he was a Tunisian rabbi, moved from Tunis to London, part of the great London Sephardic community, and befriended the Duke of Sussex, and they corresponded. Here is a letter that Augustus Frederick wrote to Rabbi Belaeth in English on top, and you can see he refers to the various conversations they have held at the Palace of Kensington discussing various passages in the Old Testament. I hope you're all as thrilled and as wowed by this as I am every time I teach this. Can I see a few nods of, with the wow factor here, okay? And then he actually wrote a letter to the rabbi in Hebrew. Shall we read this? Karati Igeret Milam Dai Rabbi Yitzchak. I have read the letter of my teacher, Rabbi Isaac. So we now know how Augustus Frederick, the Duke of Sussex, learned Hebrew from an individual called Isaac, whom we identify with Isaac Nathan, a Jew from Canterbury, whose father was the Chazan in Canterbury, who had moved to London and befriended the royal family and taught Hebrew to the Duke of Sussex. And he goes on. Va'anino tenlo chen chen. Al harimonim shashalachli, and I sent to him all grace uh, for the literally pomegranates which he sent to me. But the rimonim there doesn't refer to real pomegranates; it refers refers to the silver crests that go on a Torah scroll. Okay, which you all can imagine. Va'atzapelir ot panav mimeni ohavo hadorei shlomo, and I expect to see his face before me um, with love. And I ask about his uh, well-being. I mean, this is a letter from the son of King George III in Hebrew, right, to uh, the rabbi. Okay, absolutely amazing. When the Duke of Sussex died, um, based on the catalog that had been produced while he was alive, another catalog was produced. Here it is. Everything was going to be sold at auction, and the vast majority of the collection was purchased by the British Museum, now the um, British Library. That is how, for example, the manuscript I showed you at the start, the Duke of Sussex Bible, written in Catalonia in the middle of the 14th century, enters the BM, now BL, uh, collections. And there is a beautiful artistic menorah. We were talking about illuminated manuscripts earlier, of which Mark Epstein is the world's expert. Uh, another speaker for um, the OCCSP program. And there's the opening page of Genesis on the left. Another manuscript that he owns, this is an entire Bible, hence Duke of Sussex Bible, and it's uh, from Spain. This is from Germany. It's only the Torah or Pentateuch, so we call this one the Duke of Sussex 
Pentateuch, again, the opening page of the um, big lettering there, Bereshit, the book of Genesis on the right, and the first page of the text of Genesis on the left, all being collected by a member of the royal family in London. He also owned a copy, as we move from manuscripts to one example of printing. This is the first printed Hebrew Pentateuch, printed in Bologna in 1482. Only a few copies of that first printing survive. This is about three decades after Gutenberg invents the printing press, and we now have Hebrew printing as well. And the Duke of Sussex owned one copy of this. This book has an incredible history, right? There are multiple copies of this, unlike manuscripts, which are sui generis. In the age of printing, you can have a couple of hundred copies printed. Some of them still survive as this example. And here's the history of this book. And there is the inside cover again with the Duke of Sussex coat of arms and book plate prominently seen. It was owned by an Italian abbot. It was sold by the abbot to Samuel Sotheby. Yes, that's Sotheby's, who then sold it to the Duke of Sussex. It eventually went into the hands after the Duke of Sussex passed away into another English aristocrat, William Stewart, and finally enters the Lennox Library. Look in the upper left image here. It says the Lennox Library, 1895, which becomes the New York Public Library. And so that's where this book is today, but it was owned by the Duke of Sussex, as you can see. And just to give you a sense of the value of these things, now this book has been in the New York Public Library since 1895, formerly the Lennox Library, but another copy of this sold for almost $4 million uh, just a few years ago by a Christie's auction. So you can get a sense of the incredible value of this material. Prince Augustus Frederick, the Duke of Sussex, one of my personal heroes for all the reasons that I hopefully have explained uh, to you. Now, let's go back earlier in time in England to the remarkable individual Robert Harley, and you see his biography here, Speaker of the House of Commons and many other uh, roles that he played high in the English government and also a patron of the arts, including Jonathan Swift and Alexander Pope, with whom he was friends. And he also amassed a huge personal library, including Hebrew manuscripts. Uh, they were held at his ancestral home in Herefordshire, uh, right against the border with Wales uh, in the far west of England. And remember what I said about viewing the crown or Downton Abbey and these libraries, yes, they're in this home. And eventually when he dies, his manuscript collection was sold by his heirs to the newly founded British Museum, which I showed you at the very start. Uh, what did he own? He also owned another Bible from Catalonia. If it looks like the one that the Duke of Sussex owned, it's because they're from the same place and from the same time. And almost undoubtedly, the two scribes knew each other because look how similar the two um, manuscripts are to one another. But it wasn't just biblical material that these English collectors were interested in because you may say, well, of course they wanted Bibles because the Bible is also part of Christianity. They were interested in anything Jewish. Harley owned a copy of Maimonides' Code of Jewish Law. Now the code goes back to the 13th, 12th century when Maimonides was alive, but this manuscript was written in Lisbon, 1472. It comes into Robert Harley's collection also now in the British Library. And he owned a festival prayer book. And you can see, if you can read the Hebrew, these are, this is the opening page of the Passover liturgy in this festival prayer book. And there's the stamp of the British Museum. Again, everything gets transferred to the British Library. All of these are owned by Robert Harley uh, and other similar British aristocrats, including, as I started with, the Duke of Sussex. Footnote, what did it cost the British Museum to purchase the 7,000 plus manuscripts? They weren't all Hebrew manuscripts, several hundred Hebrew. 7,000 plus manuscripts were sold by Hawley's heirs for 10,000 pounds. <laughs> you realize that that's almost nothing, right? That's 2.75 million pounds today. A single manuscript sells for 2.75 million pounds, never mind 7,000 of them. And they go from his home into the British Museum. The 
great collector, the great collection of the British Library has as one of its crown jewels, so much so that this one is on public display. You can enter the British Library and see this in a showcase, along with other treasures of the British Library, copies of the Magna Carta, First Folio Shakespeare, and so on. This is the Golden, Golden Haggadah, also written in Northern Spain, Catalonia, probably Barcelona itself, with these images of the story of the um, Exodus. You see the Egyptians drowning in the Sea of Reeds there on the bottom left, um, and the pursuit of the soldiers on the bottom right. This was purchased by the British Museum from a Jewish collector, an Italian Jew, uh, Giuseppe Almanzi. Uh, when he died, uh, his manuscript collection was bought by the British Museum slash British Library. So that's where it is uh, today, the exquisite golden Haggadah. Again, Mark Epstein has uh, published on, on this. And just to show you a few of these pages, in the bottom right, you'll see that I've got um, links. Um, these are all digitized today, right? Almost everything in the British Library, as is true of Oxford and Cambridge, as I showed you in the prior weeks, uh, is available uh, on the web, which of course is how I'm able to capture these exquisite photographs. Um, for those of you who can read the Hebrew on the upper right, Halach Ma'anya, famous passage at the beginning of the Haggadah. Here is the Manishtana starting, continued on the next page. And here is Abadim Hayinu, right? So these are all familiar to you. And again, I always like to remind people, right? The Seder, the Haggadah doesn't come to us as a printed book that is at our table. And we, we ask people to turn to page 12 or whatever it is, right? They all, the text comes to us from these incredible medieval manuscripts, gilded, beautiful ink. And yes, wine stains, no different than our own Haggadot today. All of this material in the British Library uh, was cataloged uh, more than 100 years ago by George Margoliot, who produced a three volume collection, uh, more than a thousand pages. And here you see the title page of the catalog, a photograph of uh, Mr. Margoliot, the librarian at the British Museum in charge of Hebrew and other Semitic languages. Okay. I want to take a side journey away from Hebrew for a moment because it is such a special story and it really speaks to the heart of English or more widely British culture. Uh, the Septuagint, we need some backstory first. The Septuagint is the Bible in Greek. Um, for those of you who don't know this, uh, the Jews translated the Bible into Greek in Egypt, in Alexandria, in the third century BCE during the reign of King Ptolemy II. The Torah, the prophets and writing sections of the Bible, which would um, be translated in the following century. Um, this is the first time the Bible ever gets translated into another language. In fact, it may be the first time in world history that any sacred text gets translated into another language so that the followers of that religious tradition who no longer knew Hebrew well enough because they're living in a Greek speaking diaspora in Alexandria needed to access the text in a Greek translation. And we call that work the Septuagint, meaning the 70, because the legend is it was translated by 70 Jewish scholars. Now, that becomes the Bible of Christianity, because when Christianity spreads, it's in a Greek-speaking milieu in the eastern end of the Mediterranean, the eastern portion of the Roman Empire. In the west, they use Latin, but in the eastern part of the Mediterranean where Christianity originates, including in the land of Israel, it's a Greek-speaking environment. And eventually, the Christian church creates what you see in front of you, what's known as the Codex Sinaiticus, for reasons I will explain, a fourth century manuscript, complete Bible in Greek, that is to say the entire Old Testament translated by the Jews, copied afresh now by Christian scribes, and the New Testament together. We think probably written in Caesarea in the land of Israel. Now, why is, so this is the earliest complete Greek Bible that we have, right? Old and New Testaments together. Not quite Jewish, but the vast majority of this text is Jewish because the Jews were the ones who translated the Old Testament into, uh, into Greek. 
Um, this is the traditional location of Mount Sinai, known in Arabic by the local Bedouin as Jebel Musa. And at the base of Mount Sinai is St. Catherine's Monastery. This massive walls. Do you see the picture? Do you see the, uh, the size of the people down here, right? To give you a sense of the massive walls of St. Catherine's Monastery. So the codex that I showed you, uh, this bound volume written in Israel, was brought to the Sinai sometime soon after it was written and was there in this monastery for more than a thousand years. In fact, into the 19th century. Hence, we call it Codex Sinaiticus. Then what happened? Here's the map to show you where the uh, monastery is at the southern end of the uh, Sinai Peninsula. And many, some of you may actually have visited the spot. How did it get to Europe? Enter, the, in, enter into our story a German scholar, Konstantin von Tischendorf, who made two trips to Sinai. In his first trip, he convinced the Greek Orthodox monks there to allow him to take 43 leaves back to Germany, to Leipzig, where he could study them because he said he would come back and he'll return them. Well, he comes back to Sinai, this time under the patronage of the Tsar. Greece is a very small country, and the Greek Orthodox Church is accordingly relatively small. Russia and the Russian Orthodox Church are much larger and more powerful, and the Tsar is the head of that Russian Orthodox Church. And they always saw themselves as the protectors of the Greek Orthodox and some of the other Eastern Orthodox traditions because nobody is as big as Russia. So the Tsar sponsors Tischendorf's second journey to Sinai, and Tischendorf doesn't return the first 43 leaves. In fact, he takes the remaining 347 leaves with him back to Russia. Everybody has a different story. Tischendorf said that the Tsar requested that he bring them back, and the Greek Orthodox monks at St. Catherine's Monastery said, say he stole them. So we have no way of, of serving as the arbiter of that dispute, but in any case, Codex Sinaiticus winds up mainly in Russia in the 19th century. Now, that's fine when you have the czars ruling the place. What happens when the communists take over? Joseph Stalin has no need for a Bible manuscript, right? And look at the year 1934, the depression, the thing that Russia needs is money, right? Even communists need money. So the Soviet Union has to get some funds and they start selling things off. And what do they sell? Because they have no need for the Codex Sinaiticus. They decide to sell it to the British Museum. But of course, it's also a depression in England and there's a depression everywhere in the world. How is England or Great Britain going to, to raise 100,000 pounds to buy the Codex Sinaiticus? They do it through a public subscription. Small churches, parishes, some individuals, everybody contributing funds to the British Museum so it could purchase Codex Sinaiticus, and it does, and it brings it to the British Museum, now the British Library, where again, it is on, it is, uh, on public display. This is one of the greatest treasures of all of humanity, and its story from the land of Israel to the Sinai Peninsula to uh, Russia, to England is an incredible narrative. And I cannot tell you how important this manuscript is. This is the manuscript that all scholars use to fix the text of the Greek translation of the Bible, the Septuagint, to fix the text of the New Testament. Because when you have manuscripts, you might have variations from one scribe to another. There is nothing more important in Greek biblical uh, um, uh, uh, scholarship, including uh, those who do the Hebrew Bible but need to consult the Greek translation and for New Testament scholarship than this. Today, again, it's in London. So 347 leaves are in the British Library. 43 leaves still are in Leipzig, by the way. Uh, three leaves got left behind in St. Petersburg and um, 12 leaves and 14 fragments were found later on in St. Catherine's Monastery that the, can I use the word, the wicked Tischendorf was never able to locate or something like that. Uh, so what do you do today? Well, you put it all together at a website, uh, and that's this website here, codexsanaiticus.org. All of the material has been digitally reunited, no matter where it is, 
at these four different locations. So you can turn every page and look at every Greek passage that you may ever need to consult, which I and my colleagues who work on this material do on a regular basis. And so it was here at the British Museum reading room, and today it is now here again at the still relatively new British Library. So that gives you a sense of everything that's in London. Before we move off to Manchester, I wanted to show you the Duke of Sussex, Robert Harley, other collectors, and a side journey, because if we're calling our series England as the custodian of the Jewish past, you may say, well, Codex Sinaiticus isn't quite Jewish. It's a production of Christian scribes, that's true, but you can see that it's very much a Jewish text as well, the vast majority of it, including the New Testament, by the way, for which one could make the claim is also a Jewish text. And it tells you something about the British people that they would want to buy a Bible from Joseph Stalin to have as part of their national treasure. And they raised the money doing it, a few shillings here, a couple of pounds there, and they were able to bring that amazing manuscript to London in the 1930s. Before we head uh, to the Ryland Library, a few quick questions that I think we should just bring up. Um, sure, go ahead. You, mentioned, you mentioned the name Holly and Harley. And the so, question sorry, is, Harley, Robert. Yeah, Harley, sorry. So there is no Holly. It's no, my Harley. mistake, Harley. Yeah. It's, uh, it's your accent coming out from- I guess. You know, right. um, uh, people ask, what's the difference? Like, how do you describe what a leaf is compared to another term um, used for a manuscript? A, a leaf is a page of a manuscript which has written, or stuff written on two sides. So a leaf and a folio is the same thing. Let me put it to you this way. In a printed book today, every page gets its own number. So a single sheet, imagine I'm you know, holding up a, a handout or something, right? Would have two sides. And so a 500 page book has 250 leaves or folios, because today we call them pages. In a medieval manuscript, like a codex or any of these manuscripts, we call them a folio which is the Greek, sorry, which is the Latin word for leaf. Hence our term fall foliage. Hence we leaf through a book. Everybody following all this, right? So hopefully that explains what a leaf or a folio is. Okay. That's it. Good, great. I think that, okay. Those are the relevant ones. Happy to, happy to take those. Let's go to Manchester. Uh, the John Rylands Library. Uh, on the exterior, typical Victorian building. I, to my eyes, it's, got, it's aesthetically pleasing, but it doesn't warn you, if I can use that word, for what happens when you enter on the inside. It is magnificent. It is absolutely magnificent. Uh, and if it evokes a cathedral, which of course it does, as you can see on the left, uh, it was built with the intention of being uh, a cathedral to learning, and in fact, it is. Let's explain who John Rylands was and so on. John Rylands was, an ex was a wealthy industrialist in Manchester. For those of you who do not know this, the Industrial Revolution basically begins in Manchester, uh, and it's all due to the textile trade. England is importing cotton. They're importing cotton, especially from India, which of course they ruled. Victoria was proclaimed the Empress of India, in, in, in addition to being the uh, Queen of the United Kingdom. They also brought cotton from the American South, but by the way, they boycotted the American South. The city of Manchester boycotted the American South during times of slavery, and only after the Civil War began to import cotton from the American South. Um, there's actually a statue. This is across the street from the town hall of Manchester. There's a statue of Abraham Lincoln right there as well. So John Rylands imports cotton and creates basically the machinery for what we would now call ready to wear, right? In other words, you didn't have to go to the tailor anymore to have something made for you, a man with a suit or a woman with a dress. You now had the industrial revolution with the textile industry in Manchester. And at the center of all that is John Rylands, who becomes exceedingly wealthy um, and was a bibliophile. When he died, his wife, Enriqueta Rylands, uh, built this uh, in his memory. Uh, using the family fortune to build the John Rylands Library um, in the city of Manchester. Here's a picture of Mr. and Mrs. Rylands uh, pictures, and there are statues of them as you enter the library today. As I said at the end of last week, I have a special place in my heart for the city of Manchester. 
Uh, my mother came of age in Manchester. It's a city that I had visited and I still have relatives there. And just to give you a little of her biography, she was born in Berlin and she was part of the Kindertransport in 1939, which brought her from Germany to England. And she lived with a family in Manchester for eight years. So from her age of 15 to her age of 23, and I have no doubt that it's uh, that um, part of my family heritage, which brought to me the Anglophilia, uh, which I have. Okay, what's in the Rylands Library that's so important? We talked about the Septuagint, and I showed you the great Codex Sinaiticus. The oldest fragments of the Septuagint are here at the John Rylands Library. Notice the date, second century BCE. So these found in Egypt, this is written on papyrus. These are absolutely Jewish, right? These would have been produced by the Jewish community of Egypt. Uh, the only people who would have had the Bible in Greek or in any language would have been Jews. There's no Christianity yet. So these are the oldest uh, fragments of the Septuagint discovered uh, 104 years ago in the John Rylands Library. Precious, precious treasures, tiny little fragments, but precious, precious treasures. The oldest New Testament manuscript, we're looking at a very small fragment again, just a few words, but also the oldest New Testament manuscript from the second century BCE is also in the Rylands Library. Now, for those of you who don't know about the four gospels, John, and this is John chapter 18, uh, written on two sides of the papyrus you see here. John chapter 18, uh, John is the, old, is the latest of the gospels written around the year 100. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are all earlier, written in the late 60s, 70s, maybe 80s CE of the first century CE. John is written around the year 100, and that's important for the following reason. Do you realize we don't have an autographed copy from the gospel writer himself, but this is a fragment of a manuscript which would have been written within a generation or two of the actual authorship of the Gospel of John. I mean, that is just fascinating and fantastic that this was found, and again, it makes its way into the John Rylands Library. It is so precious that is it in a special display case, not the best of photos, but you see it here, in a special display case, because everybody wants to see the oldest New Testament fragment that we have actually from the first century of Christianity, first half century of the authorship of the Gospel of John. But back to Hebrew manuscripts, and we will spend some time looking at this particular one. Uh, the crown jewel of all Hebrew manuscripts in Manchester is uh, Ryland's manuscript Hebrew number six, written either in Catalonia, northern Spain, or Provence, southern France, which was one cultural continuum, hard to tell the difference sometimes, um, between the two. Again, totally digitized, as you see here from the link. Uh, a Passover Haggadah, and again, it starts out with Halach Ma'anya uh, in gilded letters right here, and the Manishtana, why is this night different from all other nights? again, in gilded letters. Do you have a sense uh, of what it would take to produce a manuscript like this? The quality of the parchment, the ink, the hues, the colors, the gilding, and so on. And you see, I call this folio 20V, that is to say 20 verso. On the other side of this would be 20 recto. This is 20 verso, going back to the conversation about leaves slash folios. What a remarkable manuscript. And now I've shown you the next page as well, 21R. Um, and you see again, um, important sections are, are indicated, highlighted by the larger letters in gilding, Avadim Hayinu again, in the middle of the image on the left. Now, um, remember that this manuscript was written in Christian Europe. Um, somewhere, like I said, in Provence or Catalonia. Um, the Jews would be familiar with the scribal techniques of their Christian neighbors. Why? Because Jewish scribes and Christian scribes would frequently work side by side in the same workshop. Where are you gonna get parchment? Where are you gonna get ink? Where are you gonna get gilding? Where are you gonna find artists? Where are you going to find everything you need? A pen, stitching, Binding, all of that is going to happen in the same workshop. And we know that Jews and Christians worked side by side because you had to go and get the materials. 
And so Jewish manuscripts tend to look like that of the larger cultural context, which in this case would be Christian Europe. Now I'm showing you, I'm using that as the lead in to show you the following. So there's a section in the Passover Haggadah where it says, Amar Rabbi Elazar. So Rabbi Elazar speaks at this point. And so the scribe, you know, beautiful, and the artist box it in, as you can see here, and again, more gilded letters. And on the right has a picture of Rabbi Elazar on a chair pointing to his name, holding a book. Now, what does he look like there? How would any medieval Jewish scribe know what Rabbi Elazar, who lived more than a thousand years earlier, would look like? And the answer, of course, is he would not have. And I guarantee you, he would not have been on a chair looking anything like that. Okay, where does the idea of this image come from? From Christian manuscripts, right? This is the way the Christians envisioned the gospel writers sitting on chairs, who obviously didn't sit on chairs either <laughs> back in the first century, contemporary with Rabbi Elazar of the, Haggad, the Passover Haggadah. But by the Middle Ages, these are early medieval, they are portraying their gospel writers as seated on these kinds of chairs. And so when you see Rabbi Elazar here, look how similar it is to the style of the chairs, to the clothing, to the robes, and so on and so forth. Okay, you get a sense of how the scribe who created the John Ryland's Haggadah went about his work. You turn a few more pages in the Passover text, and you get to Folio 30V, and now you have Rabban Gamliel, again, one of the great rabbinic sages who's quoted in the Passover Haggadah. And the word Rabban, nice, big, bold, gilded, and so on. And on the right, a picture of him. Now, what's the difference this time? He's now in a canopied chair. That's a higher status. Notice the canopy. Where did our scribe get that idea? Look again at Latin Bibles from a more, more or less the same time period. This one's in the Morgan Library in New York. Or this one also in the Morgan Library in New York, right? This is the bishop seated in a canopy chair with an open book. So that's how you get Rabban Gamliel portrayed. But where did the scribes get this idea from? Because this comes right out of churches. The bishop sits in a major chair and ascends the pulpit canopied when he gives the homily. And so here's Canterbury Cathedral on the left and a French cathedral on the right to show you what the architecture looks like. So when you wanna show the great Rabban Gamliel as the equivalent of more or less a Christian bishop, right, who is portrayed this way in the manuscripts will do the same thing with Rabban Gamliel, which of course evokes church art because our Jewish scribe somewhere there in Southern Europe knows the Christian cultural context um, of his neighbors. That is the crown jewel of the John Ryland's library. Visitors to England go to London, they may go to Oxford and Cambridge, which are each an hour train ride away from London, but you need to also visit Manchester, that other great city of Northern England with its incredible library collection. The coda to my three presentations, Oxford, Cambridge, and today London and Manchester. Why England? Why doesn't this kind of material exist in France or in Spain or in Germany or in Italy? And the answer is it does. You have manuscripts in all those major libraries, but nothing like the concentration of material that you have in England. Why England? Let's go back to 1611, the production of the King James Bible, which I mentioned in my first talk, uh, published in 1611 under the uh, uh, sponsorship of King James I of England. And on the title page, notice at the very top, you have the four letter name of God, yod heh vav -Hey, in Hebrew. This was a tradition because of the English Protestant Reformation with the establishment of the Church of England, going back to Henry VIII, but here we are less than a century later with the King James Bible being produced. Hebraism, if I can use that expression, uh, is imbued in the English church, in the Church of England, then and through the ages and now 400 plus years later. In fact, at King's College Chapel, 
one of the most beautiful buildings in Cambridge, the Tetragrammaton, the same four letter name is written on the doorway as you enter into, above the doorway, as you enter into King's College Chapel. In fact, to my eye, the font of the King James Bible, yud heh vav -Hey, looks very much like the font carved into the wood uh, above the entrance to King's College Chapel, built, by the way, by Henry VIII. So this is there from the very beginning in the Church of England, in their book production, in their architecture as well. They understood that the Hebrew tradition, the Jewish tradition, spoke to the very formation of the Church of England in a way that was not the case, to be sure, with the earlier Roman Catholic Church from which the Church of England broke away when Henry VIII established his own uh, new uh, religious approach. Now, the first generation of people to grow up with the King James Bible includes John Milton. Look at his birthday, 1608. Birth year, 1608. That's the young Milton on the left and the older Milton on the right. John Milton is the great poet of the age and is also a leading Puritan theologian. So when he writes uh, Paradise Lost, uh, he is fully imbued with that same English church system that I've been talking about, although he was leaning more towards the Puritans than to the official uh, Church of England. And he's in Cambridge. He would know this building. He would see the yod heh vav -Hey, and he learned Hebrew. Milton knew Hebrew very well. I mentioned that two weeks ago. I come back to Milton now as well. And here's a great sidebar comment. How many of you know that John Milton tutored Roger Williams in Hebrew? The same Roger Williams, how many of you are tuning in from New England? Uh, Ari is originally from Boston. Uh, the same Roger Williams who moves from England to Salem, Massachusetts uh, in a Puritan community and then goes off on his own five years later to establish Providence Plantations the liberalism of Rhode Island, which eventually brought the Jews there. Roger Williams was still alive when the Jews arrived in Newport in 1658. In other words, it goes from Henry VIII to the King James Bible, to John Milton growing up reading the G King James Bible, to Roger Williams, to American liberalism in, in, in um, Rhode Island. I mean, this is an amazing story, which I hope you're all uh, enjoying here or appreciating. Uh, the great historian of the 20th century, the great historian of, of, of Great Britain, Hans Kohn, uh, of, 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 um, who really captured British essence in the 20th century, uh, he was, it was obvious to him that the English self-identification with the Hebrews of the Old Testament, uh, and especially by the Puritans, but even by the Church of England, was so much present in everything in that country. And here's his famous quotation from his essay, uh, The Genesis and Character of English Nationalism. Quote, the three main ideas of Hebrew nationalism dominated the consciousness of the period. We're talking about 16th, 17th, 18th century England, when all these manuscripts were being collected by the people I showed you in the last three weeks. The chosen people idea, the covenant, the messianic expect expectancy, that informs English Christianity. Milton is the greatest poet that England ever produced. I will say that because that's what my English department colleagues tell me as well. And of course, I was an English major as an undergraduate and have all of this love for all of this material. He was revered by later generations. It's the only way to say it. He was revered by Wordsworth, but especially by William Blake. Blake revered Milton so much that he brought him back to life. He brought him back to life, quote unquote, that is to say, by writing his own poem, Milton, because Blake wanted to have a conversation with Milton. He wanted to experience the Christianity that Milton knew, and he brought him back to life in his own poem, Milton, when Blake was also the artist who engraved what you see in front of you here. And it is a remarkable poem, the relationship between one older English poet um, and one later English poet who obviously didn't live at the same time period, but creates the sort of the fictive conversation between the two of them. In the preface to that book, to that poem, Blake wrote this poem that you see here in his own hand. That's what you're looking at. And notice the quotation at the bottom. 
It's not from the New Testament. Obviously, Jesus is mentioned there in the preface at the beginning. They quote from the Old Testament, right? Would to God that all the Lord's people were prophets. That is as Protestant as it gets, right? There's no hierarchy like you have in the Catholic Church. Would to God that all the Lord's people were prophets. And Blake writes the poem and did those feet in ancient time. And the last two lines are, till we have built Jerusalem in England's green and pleasant land. Now, this becomes the unofficial national anthem of Great Britain. The poem by Blake was set to music a century later by Hubert Perry and then orchestrated by the great Edward Elgar. It was so important to England, King George V actually preferred this hymn, which I will play for you in a moment, um, to the official national anthem, God Save the King, or as it's now, God Save the Queen. So let me play this, and I'm hoping that it actually works because we had a technical difficulty earlier. Symphony Orchestra on the closing event of the proms held every year in London. Inspired by John Milton, the poem by William Blake, set the music by Hubert Parry, or case orchestrated by Edward Elgar. A country that states, till we have built Jerusalem in England's green and pleasant land, any country who holds that as its national anthem, you now understand why England is the custodian of the Jewish past. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have time for a few quick questions? We've had a few. I, so I, I, have to, I have to catch my breath after listening to the orchestra again. It just is staggering. And of course, everybody in the UK, you know, knows the lyrics to that as well as they do to uh, God Save the Queen. Well, I did not know that, but, you know, I'm not uh, an Anglophile yet. I, you know, I, I was trying to get there with my daughter, Clara, after she graduated high school two years ago, but, um, <laughs> but uh, we've been in lockdown, so I haven't been able to get there for a while. Uh, first question, what are the proms? Because I have no idea. People ask the question. Can you give us a quick primer? The proms is the greatest musical celebration of classical music in the world, probably. It starts in the summertime. Uh, anybody who's chiming in here from uh, England can help me. June, July, August, I think, usually maybe into September. And it's music venues all over the country. Uh, and the closing evening is always at the um, uh, Royal Albert Hall, which is what you just saw but people are in every city uh, park uh, all over the country on big screens nowadays watching the final conclusion from uh, the Royal Albert Hall. So yeah, and the BBC has its own orchestra. It's sponsored by the BBC and it's been going on for, I don't know, half a century or more every year. And even during COVID, they were able to figure out how to do it, obviously not with the attendance that you just saw. I did enjoy the song other than I saw the reference to satanic mills or hills. I don't know what that was. This was, Bla so let me, I actually can talk about the satanic mills. Blake, the romantic, was opposed to the industrial revolution. He saw what it was doing, black soot spewing out of chimneys in English cities. And the whole romantic movement of which Wordsworth and Blake were the leaders and the founders was to get out into the countryside and write romantic poetry. Um, and it was Wordsworth and Blake and Lord Byron and a little bit later Robert Browning and Coleridge, whom I mentioned before two weeks ago, who knew Hebrew, by the way, as well. Uh, they all understood this. And so the Satanic Mills refers to the, uh, in the, 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 the incipient Industrial Revolution. Thank you. Um, so let's go back to your first part of the presentation when we're in the British Museum, Duke of Sussex. You've explained why Hebrew manuscripts were collected and maybe the impact they had on, on the society, the people in England. Why was Duke of Sussex, though, so um, in favor of the Jewish people? I can understand the Jewish texts because they relate to the history, the, the tradition, the religion. But is there a reason that the Duke of Sussex in particular um, liked Jewish people and tried to help? Uh, I didn't mention this in the, um, I think George III had six I think there's seven or eight children. I think there are six, five or six sons, all of whom entered the military, um, it, which was typical. I mean, you still see it today, right? Uh, um, Prince William and Prince Harry have served in the in the in, in the royal armed forces. Um, the Duke of Sussex uh, was the only one who did not. Um, I'm not sure what the reasons for that is. Uh, I think he was the youngest of all the sons, and he was a he was a bookworm. He was a bibliophile. And once you learn book knowledge, once you have book knowledge, 
And once you see what the Jewish people have contributed to obviously their own religion, but to Christianity and world culture, he understood that. And all I can say without being an expert on his life, I'm more of an expert on his manuscripts, um, is that uh, it, 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 if you begin to study this material, you begin to realize the importance of the Jews to the history and culture of the world. And I can only say that the Duke of Sussex was um, uh, convinced of this and began to uh, lobby uh, from the royal family right, for the civil rights of the Jews. You know, one thing that was pointed out by a few people, I think who are probably particularly from England, is that they don't feel today that um, the society in a whole is very um, pro-Jews. In other words, they see a lot of anti-Semitism. I don't know whether that's anti-Israelism and it crosses over into anti-Semitism or if you can separate the two, but I don't know if you even want to comment on it, but it seems like there is this um, dichotomy between the love for Jewish material culture and the love for Jews. So mm -hmm. just wanted to bring that, <laughs> that up and that there is anti-Semitism apparently today and maybe even in the church. I don't know, but I am getting lots of emails to that to that point, and it, that may be the truth. You could love, you could love the material culture of another culture and and related to your own culture, but it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to love the people of that culture. Um, I, I don't know the answer to this question mainly because I'm not an expert on the 20th and 21st centuries. Right, uh, I live in the past, and I don't want to hide my head from what is uh, undoubtedly uh, the um, uh, you know, the viciousness of anti-Semitic tropes that constantly arise, including, as we know, and became very public in the Labour Party, uh, including the leader of the Labour, the previous um, leader of the Labour Party, um, uh, Jeremy Corbyn. But uh, uh, so I, I, I don't know how to answer the question. Um, does it exist? The question is, yes, of course. Does it exist there less or more than in any other place? Uh, there are people, of course, who try to judge these kinds of questions, and I will, you know, just basically say I don't have ready explanations for any of this and don't know the answers to all of this. Um, you know, Jonathan Sachs, uh, the late beloved rabbi, um, had, you know, good relations with the various prelates, including the Archbishop of Canterbury, so I really don't know um, uh, how to respond to this other than, yes, I know it exists, as it does in America when we see things like Charlottesville just a couple of years ago or Pittsburgh. You know, yeah, have, have you, when you're doing your research, when you go in to look at the Jewish aspects and all these libraries, do you encounter any resistance or do you encounter, encounter people who are working in libraries who are very happy to work with you? No resistance whatsoever. The librarians uh, are just thrilled to have any scholar from the world come and work on this material. Um, and you know most of them who are the um, most of them who are the custodians of this material are not Jewish. Um, they're all Hebraists, first class Hebraists, uh, and this is all they want to do is sponsor the scholarship, and they share the same love and appreciation of this material as I do. From Irene Lancaster, who lives you know in the area, first Irene says that you should definitely everyone who visits should go to Manchester. I've never been to Manchester, so now I'll have to go and actually have tea with Irene when I can, when I can, and maybe we'll go to uh, check out this great library. But she if, you're waiting, if, if you wait a year or two, they're building the new bullet train from London to Manchester. I don't know. Irene will know more than I, I like an hour to Birmingham and an hour and a half to Manchester, some incredible speed. Yes. We may have to wait a year and a half. <laughs> um, Irene wanted to point out something about the Rylands Library. It's famous for housing the C.P. Scott Archive. And she mentioned C.P. Scott practically single-handedly worked with Chaim Weiss, Weitzman, um, then working at Manchester University and later first president of Israel to persuade Churchill and Balfour, both MPs um, in the area of North Manchester, to pursue what became known as the Balf Balfour Declaration. Balfour Declaration. So um, another interesting connection to Manchester. Do you, do you think that this, the stuff that you were talking about here maybe has this connection to, to the, the Balfour Declaration, or is that just a, kind of the work of individuals? Well, there's no, there's, again, you know, when you move into 20th century and um, uh, Zionism and those topics that are way beyond my ken, I have, you know, colleagues who teach all of that material at, at Rutgers. Uh, Chaim Weizmann was a chemist at um, University of Manchester and um, developed armaments, which were very much used in World War I, if I recall and uh, befriended Lord Balfour. And yes, um, 
Uh, Lord Balfour was another example of what we would call an Ohev Yisrael, a lover of the Jews, uh, and um, issued the declaration on behalf of His Majesty's government. Going back to the materials you showed us, um, I think we, you know, some of us who followed, particularly Mark Michael lectures, have seen the Rylands Haggadah. We have some time with some of the documents you've shown us. The Duke, we actually did a, a program about the, something in the Duke of Sussex um, a Pentateuch. Um, so that, so everything again kind of connects. We do spiral learning. Whether we intend to or not at CSP. So you now have connected some other dots for us. I want to talk about the Codex uh, Sinaitic, Sinaiticus. Is that the correct pronunciation? Yeah. So what do you take out of it with respect to the uh, the Humash, the, the first five books that are in there? Is there anything interesting that comes out of it when you read that text um, versus our Masoretic traditional text that's different or is it consistent? Um, right. So there's very, there's, it, 98% it's the same, and some, some large, I don't know if anybody can, has ever quantified it, maybe more. So um, the when the Jews translated the Bible into Greek, in the second, third, second, third and second centuries BCE, the biblical text in Hebrew was not fixed yet. It was what we call a fluid text. Each scribe did more or less what he wanted or what he inherited from his teacher. So we don't have a fluid text. We know this from amongst the Dead Sea Scrolls. There is the beginning of one, which emerges as the Masoretic text. But every once in a while, the Septuagint diverges. And those divergences are important for those of us who work on minutiae. I mean, they're not really important. Um, so, you know, according to Exodus chapter 1, which we will read this coming Shabbat, um, 70 members of the people of Israel went down to Egypt. I'm doing this from memory. In the Septuagint, it says 75, right? That's not going to change the world, uh, that, that little difference. But, you know, these are the kinds of things that we look at, uh, these very minor changes. When we had Mark Michael with us talking about illumination manuscripts, he argued that actually the illumination maybe was not necessarily done by Jews because Jews weren't allowed in the guilds. But you talked about Jews working with non-Jews together on manuscripts. Do you have a different opinion than Mark has about who did the art? Oh, no, I defer to Mark on all of this material because he's the art historian. Uh, we occasionally, I showed it the first week, we do know of the Jewish artist who produced the art for the Kennecott Bible because he gives us his name in a colophone, that colophone that I showed you, the full page uh, two weeks ago. Uh, if we don't know the name of the artist, it's possible that they were Christian artists. Absolutely. The Jew would have been a... Um, uh, this, the scribe would have been Jewish, of course, to know that kind of Hebrew, but it's not impossible, and Mark has good evidence for it, that he would have employed a, um, a Christian artist to help him with the artwork. So yes, absolutely, Mark's correct on that. Um, you know, many other questions. I'm not sure we can get to many more, given some time constraints over here, but um, I think you've given us a lot to think about. What I appreciate in particular is you connecting the dots to us, I did not grow up, you know, I'm, I'm actually from Africa. I'm from Eastern Europe for probably 400 years. I don't know exactly. I could definitely go back to 1740. Uh, then Africa, my family's been there for 100 years. We left in 73. So then I grew up in the Boston area, maybe went to California. So I've traveled um, quite a bit, but um, what I appreciate, but I, but I did learn a lot of, uh, you know, American history. And whenever I go back to Boston, I do enjoy going to the great sites and taking my kids there because uh, there's not much American history out here. <laughs> We're in Orange County, California, but there is on the <laughs> East Coast and particularly in Boston. So it's nice that you've connected. I knew about the Hebrew. I knew that the Puritans wrote in Hebrew. Um, so you've connected a lot of dots for us at this program. You've showed us stuff probably many of us have never seen before. Maybe some of us have seen part of it, but in a, a new way. So on behalf of CSP, I do want to thank you. Um, and I want to thank Melissa for helping out on the technology side. I also want to wish you um, safe travels when you finally get, I know that you had a cancel trip now for December, but you're going to go in uh, February. Maybe you could tell the group what you what you may do there if you go in February. And then I do hope that you get to your trip in August. Tell us what you're doing in February. Right. So um, we were supposed to go to England on December 27th uh, for a, some days in London and then a conference in Nottingham, but we've canceled it because there's no way we're traveling now with the, uh, outbreak and spread of the uh, Omicron variant. And we understand London is really suffering quite a bit from that. But we do hope to travel to Oxford in February. Uh, I have received the high honor of an invitation to give a named lecture, the Edward Uhlendorf Memorial Lecture. Edward Uhlendorf was a uh, much beloved Semitist 
and Hebraist, who actually taught at um, SOAS in London, but lived in Oxford for uh, his professional career. And it's an honor to be able to give the uh, lecture in his memory. So hopefully that'll happen on February 15th. Uh, though we don't fly over just for a day and come back because we'll go for the week and hopefully spend time at the Baldian Library. This is all assuming everything's open. And then as we've mentioned in previous weeks in August, uh, Melissa and I are leading um, a two week tour of England with the same title, England as the Custodian of the Jewish Past, Oxford, Cambridge and London. Uh, looking at the manuscripts in Oxford and Cambridge behind the scenes at the British Library, things that I showed you today on public display, and um, side trips to Blenheim Palace, Stonehenge, Highclere Castle, and other great sites. Terrific. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for the series, and um, a thank you to our great group for um, coming together on a Sunday, on a beautiful Sunday in Southern California. And I don't, know, I don't know what the weather's like on the East Coast today, but um, it's a little later in the day. It is a football day. So um, <laughs> on top of that, we're, you know, we're, we have a great turnout for a uh, football Sunday in America. Thank you, everybody. It's dark and cool in Boston, according to Monty Krieger. So, um, okay, well, then you don't get extra credit, Monty, because where else are you going to go on a dark, gloomy day on the East Coast where COVID is running rampant? Might as well stay at home. We thank you all for being with us. We want to really thank, take a moment to thank our patron-level donors uh, High-level patron-level donors for CSP. Really, you helped to underwrite this program. I sent, uh, if you're in a certain category and above, you got a special box. Uh, I hope you get to open it and enjoy it over the next week. It was supposed to arrive maybe a little bit closer to Hanukkah, given the theme of the box, but I thought you could use it anyway. And uh, it's good to see Rosa Berman. It's good to see Irene. So Irene, Irene Lancaster didn't tell me to say this, but I think she would like to invite you to tea, Gary, you and Melissa, when you come to the area particularly. She will meet you and um, tell you all the cool stuff. Maybe she'll introduce you to the, um, the is it the former archbishop um, that Irene knows, I believe. Wow, uh, so um, Irene is very well connected in the community. And um, if Thank you, Irene. We, we look forward to the invitation, to accepting the invitation tea with Irene. And if you're in England as well, just email me. I'll put you in touch with Irene and you can have a little tea party with Professor Rensberg as long as you're uh, vaccinated, boosted, wear a mask, and don't get him sick. That would be, or, or Melissa sick. That's the preconditions. With that, everybody, have a great Sunday. Hopefully we'll see you tomorrow. Secrets of the Bible with Mark Michael Epstein uh, in his different, wearing his different kippah, as I would say, telling us about the book of Exodus Shemot. Lots going on this week before the big holiday coming up. Uh, I think I'm talking about Tu Bishvat. I don't know what you guys are talking about, but um, anyway, uh, lots of stuff coming up. Take care, everybody. Nice to see you. Everyone, thanks. thanks Be Howard. safe. You're welcome.